So welcome to our first lecture for test three. I highly recommend that you check out a video and I'm gonna post the links to it <clears throat> in the description for this video. And it's kind of cheeky and it's probably just done by a regular person, not an educator, but I think it's excellent and it will reorient you to uh, the history of Japan. Uh, so I'll put a link in there and check that out before this so you can get kind of an idea of where you're at. So the section we're gonna talk about here is the Meiji Restoration. And the years are from 1868 to 1912. But the, this particular era was kicked off by an event that happened in, on July 8th, 1853. Uh, and it was Commodore Perry, who was a commander in the US Navy, uh, and what was called gunboat diplomacy. So the US for a while in the 19th century had been trying to um, work some diplomacy to get direct access to markets within Japan. And as you know, when we talked about the Edo period, the Sokugawa shogunate did not want um, Westerners to have direct access. Uh, and that's probably a good idea to think about what we talked about with China. Um, so, but of course the US was frustrated. They wanted direct access, mostly for um, ceramics and such. So um, after many failed attempts at di diplomacy, the regular old diplomacy, where you actually sit down and talk and give gifts and such, uh, they started to practice gumbo diplomacy. Uh, Perry took his fleet, and he was ordered by U.S. president, and pointed all the guns at the port of Nagasaki and said, now is the time that you open Japan. And of course, Japan had absolutely no choice uh, in this particular um, regard. So <clears throat> what happened and why we call it the Meiji Restoration is because we we're talking about the Emperor Meiji uh, and the power swings to the Emperor. So the U.S. saw um, the Emperor as a useful kind of like a foil that they could um, get their interest through. So what we're seeing is, you know, um, the Japanese have basically been able to um, save themselves from being a victim of Western imperialism previously, uh, and um, now, you know, there's nothing that could be done. So we start to see Western culture bumping up against Japanese culture. And how people reacted in Japan is the Meiji government officially, what they wanted to do was Westernize. And we're going to look at some prints and we're going to see the effects of this. So when they talk about Westernize, um, they are talking about uh, Western kind of things in the cities, uh, you know, technology that they got from the West, uh, which they had already been developing for a while, but more technology, um, even ways of dressing and acting and learning English and things like that. Uh, but mainly what they were thinking about is weapons and military organization. So one of the results of that, oh, before I go to that, um, as you might imagine, a lot of people in Japan were not interested in westernizing. Um, they did see themselves as resisting uh, Western imperialism for so long, and they didn't feel like they needed the change, despite uh, what happened with uh, Commodore Perry. So um, a student in a previous class had shared these kind of like humorous links of a print series that was made where uh, people dressed in traditional Japanese clothes were using biological warfare against the... Americans in a kind of funny way. So like lifting up their cloaks and um, farting in their general direction. So uh, that's just a humorous way to show that many people weren't interested in this type of Westernization and wanted to keep um, Japanese traditions, modernize them, but in line with Japan and not with the West. Uh, so one of the results of these was something that freaked out the West. Um, and um, kind of shows how uh, Japan had reacted to imperialism in a way that was able to um, save them from its worst effects. But through doing that, they also built an empire um, on par with the West, and we'll see um, how that affects um, Japan when we talk about modern Japan. So the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905 uh, the Japanese clearly won that, and the war was over control of certain areas in Korea. We're going to see that happen again. Um, Korea is going to be the worst victim in these wars, uh, including World War II. 
Um, and so Japan defeats Russia, and we're going to see some of the print uh, that are talking about some of these. So when this happened, the West was freaked out. They saw that Japan was a power uh, with the military might on par with them. Now they had defeated a Western power, even though it was a, a relatively um, not as industrial power. Uh, Russia at that time wasn't very industrial, but it was still a, a Western power. So um, their kind of racist ideas about uh, Asian inferiority uh, could no longer apply here, and they had to think about uh, a military enemy on their level. So again, check out that Japanese history video that I'm going to put in the description. And then we'll move on. So this is a, a Famous Places, Meosha A uh, picture. So Famous Places in Tokyo. Picture of a Zuma bridge and a distant view of the torpedo explosion. And what I'd like you to do, <clears throat> and this is almost like a Where's Waldo on this one, uh, is try to find uh, things that are traditionally Japanese, like things that we had seen and learned about and seem continuous with the Japanese culture we'd studied before, and then try to pick out things that are Western. Uh, so do that and um, perhaps put it on the extra credit board and we'll see if you come up with some pretty good stuff. So this one uh, is a multi-series where you usually how they would release these is they would have one released uh, one day and then another one released uh, the next week and then the following week, so then you'd have to collect them all to be able to create the picture. Another thing that you could look at as far as not just the things that are within the picture, but try to figure out what about the formal elements. So what about um, line and color and perspective is Western, um, and what, is, what about it is in line with what we had seen previously in Japan? So this one, the, the name of it says everything, the illustration of the Second Army's assault on Port Arthur. And um, this is part of the Sino-Japanese War in 1894 to 1895, which is, again, over control of Korea. The Japanese take part Port Arthur on November 22nd, 1894, and then they run into a very harsh Korean winter. Uh, so in this picture, it's showing... Uh, the Japanese military, and on the other side is the Chinese military. So what I would like you to do is think about what are the differences? How is the artist portraying the Chinese military uh, compared to the way that the Japanese military is being portrayed? So that could be another thing that you could put in the extra credit board or in the comments to this video. So this one, also from the Sino-Japanese War, uh, Japan follows the retreating Chinese, and they have this long, hard winter, a story that kind of like sits within uh, modern Japanese history, uh, like Valley Forge for the United States. Uh, so it's seen as something heroic and the beginning of something bigger for Japan. One of the things I notice about this print is the interesting... Um, problem solving that's done. So when you make a print, uh, you can't really make shading so much, although there's a lot of tricks done in here to give the appearance of shading. And the artist wants to show snow, but also on a white kind of misty background. So we can see in the top of the picture, we see white snowflakes. So of course you're gonna read that as snow, but look what happens when we get closer to the ground. We're still reading that as snow. I don't think most people are thinking that the snow all of a sudden turns black when it hits the ground. Uh, so through the kind of like context that they have here and the snow covered outfits that all of the military people are wearing, uh, we get an idea of what's going on in this picture. So this one was made during the Russo-Japanese War. The enemy uh, General Prince Kuropatkin, uh, I don't do Russian, so sorry if I mispronounced that, having tactical difficulty. So the Russo-Japanese War was really about um, imperial designs of both Russia and Japan and Korea and Manchuria, which if you remember is northeastern China. So there were over 40,000 casualties and Japan uh, actually lost more people, uh, but they were willing to do so uh, and were able to defeat the Russians eventually. 
And I like this one particularly because even though it says he's having tactical dif difficulty, I believe that he's being shown in a heroic way. We're seeing him um, from below. Uh, he has a dynamic composition. Um, it's almost like a heroic enemy like the United States was fond of portraying uh, Native Americans. So modern Japan, uh, so after the Meiji Restoration, we start to see Japan develop in quite a similar way um, to uh, Nazi Germany at this time. So they become highly technological uh, and they, the military leadership starts to develop this idea of ethno-nationalism where the Japanese are this superior race of people and they continue to expand their empire, starting with Korea, moving into Manchuria, and then finally into China proper, uh, invading it in 1937. So if you learn about World War II uh, in an American history class or uh, a European history class, oftentimes they'll talk about the war starting with the Nazi invasion of Poland in 1939. Uh, but just know that it had been going on for quite a while, uh, for at least a, a decade previous to this, uh, in Korea and Manchuria, and then for China just a couple of years before. So one of the things that the Japanese were interested in, it, like any kind of war machine, is making sure that they could get the proper supplies to be able to um, supply their uh, military machines. So one of them was rubber, and synthetic rubber was just being developed during the war, uh, and it wasn't available to the Japanese. So they wanted to um, acquire um, some of the colonies in Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia specifically, that were occupied by the Dutch. Um, and the Dutch were allied with the United States. And the United States had promised a while back that they would defend uh, these colonies from any foreign um, attack or occupation. So the Japanese um, realized that. Uh, so what they wanted to do was um, kind of punch the United States in the mouth uh, so that they would uh, take some time to recover. And once they did, they could move into the Dutch colonies and be able to um, secure the supplies that they needed. So they did that in December of 1941. Um, they attacked uh, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, and there was many U.S. ships there, so they were able to do a lot of damage to the U.S. fleet at that time. And this worked for both sides, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, the United States government, uh, headed by FDR, the president at that time, uh, were interested in getting to the war but could not convince the Americans uh, with the Nazis uh, to get into uh, World War II. So with this attack uh, that killed uh, over 2,000 uh, Americans, mostly military, uh, they were able to use that attack um, to get the war started. So they declared war in the United States. Uh, they, they declared war in Japan and then uh, declared war on Germany, the Nazis, and Italy as well. So uh, for the Japanese, it worked out because they indeed were able to go in and secure what they needed. Uh, however, um, they had somewhat underestimated uh, the U.S. Uh, industrial um, capacity, and the U.S. went into full-on total war mode, which they had already been leading up to. Uh, FDR had, had been, been um, doing as much as he could to kind of lead up to this. Uh, and um, after Pearl Harbor, uh, the Japanese really basically uh, lost the war. Uh, they never uh, really had a chance after that. The U.S. Um, island hopped um, to eventually make their way to Japan. And they had a decision to make. Uh, one option uh, was to do a land invasion of Japan. They had been bombing Japanese cities with firebombs, uh, which destroyed uh, cities, like 80 to 90% of the cities, uh, and killed hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, they've been doing that for a while, but they, but they weren't able to get the um, emperor and the military leadership to surrender. 
Um, even though at, at this point, Japan had no chance of winning the war. So the other option was during the war, they had been developing a new and terrible weapon, uh, the atomic bomb. And um, many people in the Japanese leadership, especially in uh, June of 19, and in the American leadership, especially in June of 1945, when the war with the Nazis ended, and they were sure they weren't going to use it on the Nazis, uh, were interested in testing this weapon uh, beyond the tests uh, that they had done in the islands. Uh, they wanted to test it in a war situation. Uh, so they justified uh, dropping two bombs on Japan, uh, two nuclear bombs, the only nuclear bombs that were used in warfare, uh, by saying that that was the only way to get the Japanese to give up. But many historians since then um, saw it more as a test of this weapon and to show uh, rising powers like the Soviet Union uh, that they had this new terror, that the US had this new terrible whip weapon and they were willing to use it. Uh, so you could possibly justify militarily the first bomb that was dropped, um, and but the second bomb, uh, Probably not, not so much. Uh, and part of the reason why they may have dropped the second bomb is because the first one didn't uh, detonate in the way that they wanted, uh, so they weren't able to get a good test. And they had been planning to use this bomb for quite a while. Uh, they had picked certain cities that they had not firebombed, uh, basically so that they could get an idea of what kind of damage this weapon can do. Uh, so it was a very cold calculation uh, done by U.S. military leaders to do this. So after the second bomb, and then um, Stalin and the Soviet Union threatened um, also to enter the war against Japan, uh, the Japanese were for forced to surrender. Uh, and when they did, uh, that began the American occupation uh, from 1945 to 1952. Uh, so my grandfather was in the Navy in uh, 1944 and 1945, uh, and he was in the Pacific Ocean at that time. He talked about at the towards the end of the war, um, the Japanese. This kind of shows that you know they had no chance. Uh, they would send uh, one of their fighter planes over, uh, and then his boat would shoot them down. And then five minutes later, they would send another one. Uh, so basically, people were uh, Japanese pilots were progressing uh, to suicide. So with the American occupation, and my grandfather was one of the first people that landed in Nagasaki about six weeks after the bomb had dropped, um, we see a lot of changes in Japan. Uh, so immediately after the bomb was dropped, um, you know, people were, uh, about 100,000 uh, were killed in each city uh, pretty much immediately, and then another 100,000 or so uh, from radiation sickness. Uh, in the following weeks, and there had already been hundreds of thousands, uh, perhaps millions of Japanese civilians killed up until this point. Uh, so uh, they were thoroughly defeated. Um, and my grandfather talked about how he would walk uh, down the streets in Nagasaki and people who had radiation burns so that their skin was falling off uh, would actually bow to him. Uh, and there might be something to that as far as um, obviously, the United States is this occupying power. Though my grandfather is a very large man. Uh, perhaps that has something to do with it. Uh, but also, the way that he saw it um, is that people were continuing uh, Japanese traditions despite uh, the disastrous events of the past few years. So with the American occupation, Japan became a very strong ally of Japan, of the United States. They were disarmed somewhat. They armed quite readily since then, uh, and the, they basically tried to model themselves uh, after the United States and tried to become a manufacturing power. In some ways, they did model themselves after the United States. Uh, they became a very successful capitalist state, but in other ways, they um, did things a little bit differently. Uh, and by the 1970s, were able to become a somewhat of a stronger power uh, as far as manufacturing goes, uh, than the United States. Uh, since then, like every other wealthy country, uh, Japan has um, moved away from manufacturing. Um, so the results of some of this are kind of complex. Uh, so let's look at some of the themes 
of what's happening. First off, we have Dada. And if you're not familiar, Dada is a early 20th century um, in the World War I era movement, art, artistic and literary movement. And um, it started in Switzerland, uh, but it mostly by French expats who had left uh, Paris because of World War I. And it was heavily influenced by um, the French's uh, readings of Japanese philosophy, of Chinese philosophy, of Zen Buddhism. And they were very interested in the idea of doing things without deliberation, uh, koans, uh, and things like that. And they saw rationality as being a negative thing. They looked at scientific rationality as leading to the technological slaughter that World War I was. Uh, and Dada was this irrational, um, decisive kind of like response to what they saw as the, you know, practically apocalyptic at the time, it seemed, results of this long technological progress. So it kind of makes sense, um, besides the origins in Japan um, and Japanese and Chinese philosophy uh, for Dada, it would kind of make sense that it would return to Japan because they had also been destroyed beyond belief by uh, technological terror, in this case, the United States. Uh, so it kind of makes sense for Dada to come back. So what goes along with that is Zen. We're also going to see appropriation art. And this word in um, the decade of the 2010s, I guess we're about to get into a new decade, uh, is used in a different way. Uh, generally, people use appropriation to mean someone from a dominant culture or colonial power taking uh, cultural items uh, from people who have been colonized uh, and using it to make money or uh, whatever. Um, so that's not exactly what's going on with Japan because most of the appropriation is going towards Western culture. And when they talk about appropriation, they talk about um, basically absorbing a cultural practice from the outside and just spitting it back out without chewing on it at all. Um, so just copying it. And you see this type of appropriation in um, kind of street culture. Uh, I remember when I was a kid in the 80s, they would have news reports of Japanese kids. Some of them would be dressed up as like punk rockers, uh, just exactly as they had seen in England. Other ones were like greasers with a DA haircut and leather jacket and marbles rolled up. So these kind of styles were just completely copied and they weren't um, necessarily made into mixed with Japanese culture. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about appropriation. Uh, we're going to see the artists doing it as well. So pop art, um, pop art, if you don't know, it's one of the styles that was developed by several artists uh, in, the, in the West, most famously Andy Warhol. And we'll talk about an artist, um, a couple of artists' relationship with pop art. Super flat, uh, which is exactly what it sounds, but also symbolic. And uh, we'll have to get into more detail with that in just a minute. Um, design. Uh, so we had seen previously how Japanese traditional design, uh, like the um, detached palettes of uh, Katsura, uh, had influenced um, modernist uh, Western artists. Uh, but those types of like kind of design ethos of simplicity that's refined, but also with complexity within it, uh, would have a big influence on Western design. Uh, in fact, I would. I would go as far to say that um, modern design uh, and certainly some of your design teachers is Japanese design um, and or at least how, how Westerners sometimes interpret it. So given that though, uh, Japanese design, the idea of refined simplicity is um, simplified in the West. So there's many other um, kind of Japanese design movements that are more complex and less interested in simplicity uh, or form follows function or any of those things. Uh, so it's important to realize that often Westerners, they want to put um, cultures outside of the West into little boxes, which is generally what uh, design movements in the West have done for Japanese design. Uh, but remember, people always exist outside of the box. In fact, sometimes the majority exists outside of the box. 
So Emperor Hirohito, who was the emperor during World War II, dies in 1989. And this opened a big, up, a big can of worms. Um, there had been a taboo in Japan uh, post-World War II of a accounting for the crimes of the Japanese empire. Uh, so I'd mentioned how Japan was an ethno-national state, exactly as the Nazis. And they had done things like the Nazis had done. They had done experiments on living and, and awake human subjects, especially Koreans and Chinese. Uh, they had slaughtered uh, 10 million Chinese civilians, at least, uh, for, you know, I mean, literally, like, just, like, piling them up uh, in pre-dug graves, uh, not even using um, ammunition on them anymore because they, they could waste them. Uh, they had kidnapped Korean women uh, and made them rape slaves for the Japanese military. Um, and all of this was justified because, you know, the Japanese people were, were um, seen as the superior race, uh, so very similar to the Nazis. But unlike Germany, which uh, made uh, quite a bit of efforts to um, account, I mean, you can't account for uh, what had happened, uh, but they paid reparations um, to Jewish people and to others. Uh, they had given tons of money to the countries that they had um, destroyed and occupied. Uh, they had also um, illegalized things like being a Nazi, dressing as a Nazi, or Nazi symbolism. In Japan, that never happened. Uh, and we can kind of see partially why that is so based on what we've seen in Japanese culture so far. Uh, but this is really something that's coming from the elites. And one of the justifications for it is that there's a taboo about talking about this stuff while Hirohito was alive. Um, so when he dies in 1989, that taboo, which is really symbolic, it's just a way to avoid talking about these things, um, is gone. Uh, and we start to see more free discussion of the uh, crimes of the ethno-nationalist Japanese empire. Um, so Japan, as I said, had developed this incredible kind of like capitalist um, manufacturing state, and then they became a highly technological and one of the wealthiest countries in the world uh, with like a pretty good welfare state, so more like Europe and less, less like the U.S., um, and uh, like a lot of countries in the world, uh, they started to run out of gas. So uh, the biggest growth in the wealthiest countries was uh, after the war until uh, about the middle 1970s. Uh, Japan, um, for various reasons, uh, continued to grow into the 80s, uh, but they ran out of steam like every other uh, wealthy economy has and never really recovered since uh, in the 1990s. And this recession, um, which Japan didn't recover from in a decade, and they really haven't recovered from since, what had been called the lost decade. And many of the artists um, looked at this and said, this has caused uh, the Japanese to re-examine what they've done uh, as far as developing this um, heavy consumerist capitalist um, type of society. So these are the themes that we're going to see. The first art movement we're going to look at is Fluxus, which, like most uh, contemporary art movements, is an international movement. And those dates are approximate, um, especially the starting date, uh, but certainly the ending date. Uh, so some members of the Fluxus group were Yoko Ono, who's pictured here. Uh, you may know her as the um, partner of John Lennon from The Beatles. Uh, and if you're white, your racist grandparents think that she uh, broke up the Beatles because they're racist. Uh, but she was actually far more interesting than that. Uh, she was an artist, uh, one of the earliest and most influential performance artists. Uh, and she kind of moved that into music performance and was very influential on a lot of, especially um, in following decades, of a lot of independent music. Uh, it's really hard to imagine uh, some independent music without her. Uh, so Nam June Paik, who we'll talk about in more de detail, uh, George Machanis, uh, who was one of the founders of the movement. Uh, he was a New Yorker uh, of Greek origin, and he wanted to come up with something that was synthesizing a lot of the ideas like Zen and Taoism uh, that people were becoming interested in. 
Uh, so he made the name for the group a uh, synthesis. So uh, flowing and living art. Um, that's what fluxus means. So the idea with this is to counter the separation of art and life. We've already seen how in Japan, this is something that's been going on for a long time with the tea ceremony, especially for elites, where there isn't really a time where they're not being artistic and not in control of the aesthetics of how they're behaving and dressing and such. Uh, but Machanus wanted to do this at, uh, and others at a level that was kind of lower down for us regular folks. Uh, he did things like he made his marriage ceremony into uh, a big performance art event. You can Google that and kind of check it out. Uh, it got quite wild. It was New York in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, I think. Uh, so you can kind of imagine. Uh, and one I wanted to talk about in detail, because he's going to have a big influence on Nam June Paik, uh, is John Cage, uh, who's an American composer. Uh, he does some really interesting work. I'm going to um, have a link in the description of the video to one of his most famous symphonies, which you may want to watch before this. Uh, and uh, I got to see some of his music. His idea with music were that um, music was too centered on the stage. Uh, the audience was discontinuous with what was going on. Um, so you had the performers up on a stage and then the audience over here. And he kind of looked at music in the past and said, that's not the way it was. Um, it was sometimes, but a lot of times there was more of a continuity between the performers and the audience. So uh, I got to see uh, some of his music performed, not by him himself, uh, but by the Bowling Green State University um, Orchestra. And it was a very interesting experience. Uh, we came into the auditorium and seven o'clock was when it was supposed to start. And seven o'clock passes and 7.05 passes and it's like 7.10. And everybody's just kind of like rustling around wondering what the hell's going on because there's nobody on the stage, there's no chairs. You know, usually in a, in a concert, you see a bunch of tu people tuning up in their chairs, you know, all of that. But after this time, you hear people in the background like playing a horn or, um, you know, playing a drum or something like that. And then one of them will play their instrument and then walk across the stage and you'll just hear it go from one part of the stage to the next. And then uh, when you think you got to figure it out, someone will come from outside of the auditorium and the back doors and play their instrument and walk right past you. Um, and what that caused you to do as an audience member is something that we've already studied in Zen Buddhism and what John Cage was kind of interested in, and that's mindfulness. Uh, so mindfulness is being aware, so aware of everything that's going around you that if something else happens that's unexpected, uh, you can experience it fully. Um, so kind of like his music sometimes can kind of function as a koan to get people to be mindful, to be aware of all the spaces around them. So check out the video that I'm going to post with his music. So let's look at Nam Jun Paik. Uh, and I'm going to post a video of his stuff uh, that's rather compact where you can see it. Um, he's died, unfortunately, uh, rather young. So he's part of the Fluxus group uh, with John Cage, Yoko Ono. Uh, and he was interested, like the others, in Zen and Dada uh, and Taoism. Uh, and he's coming from Korea, so he's coming from a very Buddhist background. Yeah, he's probably the first um, famous um, or at least effective video artist. And to be a video artist at this time, uh, and he's starting in the 1980s, this piece is from 1993, perhaps may have been a little bit different than what you think of now. A lot of times people will call themselves video artists, but they're really kind of like performance artists. Uh, but when he thinks about video art, he thinks about using video as um, a medium and the video devices themselves as a medium. So he says, just as the collage replaced oil paint, the cathode ray tube will replace the canvas. If you're not familiar, a cathode ray tube are these old school TVs. Uh, that's what they called it. You know, if he was living in the 2000s, he would have said uh, the LCD will replace the canvas. 
And in some ways, he turned out to be correct. Many of you are working in video types of art forms, <clears throat> even if they're like professional or industrial or whatnot. Uh, it did replace some of the earlier art forms. In this piece, we see two of his main themes. Uh, one of them is music. He's a piano player himself, uh, and he's quite fascinated uh, with piano performance. This particular piano is a stand-up piano. Uh, you know, they're not particularly expensive even at that time. And what he liked to do in some of the concerts, and I'll show a little piece of this in the video that I'm going to post, is um, do what The Who at that time had done. You might have seen Nirvana do it since then. Uh, do performance, and then instead of waiting till the end, like the rock groups, to destroy all the in his instrument, he would just do it randomly in the middle of it. So he would take uh, the piano and knock it over, uh, and then you have a sledgehammer at the ready and start smashing it up. But there's a couple of problems, if you know anything <laughs> about pianos, with this particular style of art. Uh, when Rocky musicians do it, they have a, a guitar, they have a bass guitar, they have drums. Uh, if you break those apart, you know, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal if they're destroying your instruments, and I would like to have them, but um, it's not going to hurt anyone, usually. But a piano, if you know anything about that, it's a bunch of strings that are at very high tension, um, and there's 88 of them, and the high strings are at basically a type of tension where if they were to fly off at high speed, they're going to work as a razor. Uh, so that's what would happen. You would hear doing, doing, all of these strings flying in different directions, uh, and someone could get hurt. And in fact, uh, John Cage was watching one of these performances, and he was backstage, he, and he was looking kind of at the stage um, in the side area, and when um, Nam June Paik started doing this, one of those high strings flew at John Cage and hit his head and cut his face right above his eye, uh, and he was bleeding everywhere. It was a pretty serious injury. Uh, when Andrew Pegg got backstage after the performance, um, <laughs> he was trying to apologize to John Cage, uh, but Cage said, no, this is part of it. You know, I should have been mindful, should have ducked or, or something like that. It's, you know, you involved me with the performance, so it really worked. The other big theme that he likes to have is the idea of looking. Um, so things looking at uh, other things and like cameras looking at other cameras. Uh, so in this one, we can see how you have a player piano and all of these cameras and you can see it in person and hear it. But then he gives you the video image, which is a removed image. Uh, and he gives you it from many different angles and you start to think, well, what am I seeing that I'm missing in the real world? Uh, with these video images. So he continues to develop that with the help of some technology that was rel relatively new for the time. Uh, and that was um, video synthesizers, and you'll see some better examples of that in the video I'm going to show you. Um, and the video synthesizers were developed um, in Sony Labs. Uh, up until recently, m a lot of the big electronics companies had these well-funded um, labs where the workers could come up with just whatever they wanted, whatever wild idea they had. Uh, companies don't really do that anymore. They rely on the government to do that, do that type of stuff. Um, but at Sony, they had developed video synthesizers. They had developed technology to be able to integrate multiple video, video screens into one. Uh, they had developed uh, large screen technology. Uh, so he had some connections with the lab and used some of these in ways that were even beyond what the engineers at Sony had imagined you could do with it. So this piece, as you can see, has 201 television sets before laser discs. Uh, laser discs are a technology you're probably not familiar with. Uh, they basically look like DVDs, uh, but instead of being small, they're the size of a 12-inch vinyl record. And it was a way to get high-quality video and audio um, onto uh, a video disc, because at that time it was a little bit more difficult. It was pre-Blu-ray pre and such. So it's also uh, a carrier, so it can carry video, can carry um, digital information programs and such. Uh, so he's using these um, along with the software 
developed by Sony um, to kind of integrate the images, repeat images, have images that span across multiple televisions that make one image. Uh, so it's kind of amazing. And the title of it, he's looking at this new technology and saying, yeah, we're leading to a place that we can never go back from. So he called it Fin de Siecle II. Uh, sorry about the spelling there. Uh, so the Fin de Siecle was in in retrospect, looking back at it, what people looked at as the last decade of the 19th century, leading up until the 20th century. And many people look back at that and they saw all of the technological development and they saw it as uh, a time where things were moving forward and people could sense it, but also the last bits of an age. Uh, so that was the last time... Um, you know, the last decades where you could go through life and, and not see like a car, uh, eventually they developed like mass technologies. So within the first decade of the 20th century, uh, and certainly by the second and third decades, uh, life was totally transformed for many people around the world. Uh, so fin de siècle is kind of like a very important ending to a century uh, because it led to what some people considered a new age. Uh, and Nam Junpeik is saying the same thing with um, his video art, he's talking about video and also connectivity, which we'll see in the next one, and how it is putting us into a new age. So with this one, uh, TV Buddha, it's a video installation, uh, and it's from 1974, so it's one of his early ones. And you may recognize this is exactly the type of monk figure that we'd studied earlier, and is also at the DIA, uh, if you'd been there before. And what we see, we see Buddha in the meditation pose, and we have a couple of interesting things going on. We have what, and this is one of his first, first video pieces, we have the camera looking at the Buddha, and then the Buddha, he's meditating, but seemingly seeing his image on TV. In 1974, just being on TV would be a big deal. Um, like people would always want to be on television, see themselves in, in video. You know, people didn't have video cameras at the time, so it was a pretty difficult thing. Not quite the same as now. So on one level, that's how this piece works. It's like a joke. It's like, oh, look, even Buddha wants to see himself on TV. It will interrupt his um, meditation. But on another level, it's saying something that is more Buddhist. Um, remember when we had talked about uh, Zen Buddhism and how the Zen Buddhist develops through their life? When you're a child, uh, you originally have a way of looking at things that is... Um, full uh, because you don't know the words of things. You just experience things as directly as possible. Then you grow up and you have a barrier between you because you learn, learn words. You read literature and you have a barrier between you and the things that are outside of you. Um, you see that separation, but it also prevents you from having a full experience. And then as you develop, um, as you get closer to enlightenment, you can have a full experience. You know that these things are separate, but at the same time, you know they're one. So this piece is also looking at that. It's saying um, the Buddha sees, sees their body here. Uh, then they see the image that is recreated uh, there. Um, and there's not necessarily a difference between this image uh, and between the flesh around the Buddha. Um, so when you become enlightened, the image this flesh, all of these things are kind of one, um, but again, the goal of enlightenment it has to have kind of a spiritual release. Um, so, you know, on one hand, it's a joke. On the other hand, it's talking about, in a very interesting and, and new way with new technology at the time, um, talking about a very old Zen Buddhist concept. So what I'd like you to do, oh, before we go to this artist, is check out the video I have posted um, so pause it, check out the video, uh, and then I'll say a few things. So if you watch the video, get back to it. And you may have noticed, maybe chuckled a little bit in the beginning of the video, they talked about how in the future, um, the TV guide will be as thick as the New York phone book. And you're probably like, that's ridiculous, you know. <clears throat> Nobody watches TV anymore. Uh, there aren't channels per se. Uh, but... That prediction did turn out to be correct uh, from Nam June Paik. 
if you think of things like YouTube or other forms of social media, um, we do have not something as thick as the New York phone book, <laughs> which again is kind of like, you might have chuckled because that's not a thing that people have anymore. Um, so literally millions of channels uh, and tons of choices. And our life has... <coughs> fundamentally changed um, since the time that Nam June Paik was doing these works. Um, up until 1994, uh, there was no World Wide Web, uh, so there wasn't a way for people to easily communicate. Uh, and most people didn't even have internet until the end of the 90s. But can you imagine life without that nowadays? Uh, can you imagine not being connected? Uh, if you have a question about something, just being able to Google it and having access to tons of information around the world, um, being able to communicate with people across the country or in a different country, um, it's not necessarily fundamental, but it's changed um, and expanded what mass communication could be. Uh, so I think, um, <clears throat> The predictions that Nam June Paik and others had made uh, turned out to be pretty correct. Sometimes artists sort of know what's going on in the world. So Yasumasa uh, Morimura is the appropriation artist we're going to talk about. We could have talked about a bunch, but he's really <clears throat> the most important of them. So Morimura is our appropriation artist. And to give you an idea on what this means, and we're talking about appropriation, um, it means just taking it and not adding anything to it, really. Uh, so I'll go back and forth. So he took this painting by Rembrandt, the anatomy lecture of Dr. I don't pronounce Dutch words, so I'm not even going to bother. Dr. Nicholas in 1632. And see if you can check out what he changed. He only changed one thing. He changed all of the faces. So all of the faces were changed themselves. So that's Morimara, 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 Morimara. All of them, even the cadaver is Morimara, Mora. So when he does his pieces, um, he's somewhat commenting on the Japanese fascination with American Western culture that I told you about before. Um, and there was certainly a fascination with, of uh, Americans with Japanese culture. He uses masterpieces and substitutes his face for all the figures. Uh, and that was called appropriation art. But I think the best way to experience Morimura is to just go to image search on Google and you can see all of the iconic figures he's done. Uh, we have Van Gogh, um, Frida Kahlo, so some historical figures as well. He's the Mona Lisa, of course. He's Che. Um, <laughs> he's Marilyn Monroe, which is quite impressive. Uh, all of these things. Uh, he's David. <clears throat> he's Caravaggio's David holding the head or uh, holding the head of Goliath. And of course, he's both David and Goliath in this case. Uh, and this is Mori Mora, how he looks walking around everyday life. So he transforms himself into, yes, that's him. He transforms himself into these historical figures. Um, and for him, kind of talks about what this means, and I'm putting up the bear, big air quotes as far as meaning goes, uh, because he considers himself to be Andy Warhol's conceptual son. And if you're aware of um, Warhol's statements about his work, like first off, Warhol had a lot of fun when people would ask him about his work. He would tell one person one thing and then the, the next person a completely different thing and sometimes one person one thing one day and then other people something different the next day. Uh, and although, uh, especially early on, I made a lot of work that had meaning and if you pressed him, he would say it has meaning. He often said that the work isn't. He's just a mirror. He's just reflecting things and mass producing them. Uh, and that's the way that Maury Morris sees himself as a mirror. So it's important that that mirror reflect very accurately. So even though all of these are essentially self-portraits, uh, he completely transforms himself into the figures. 
So the second and last artist we'll talk about is Takashi Murakami. Uh, I can pretty much guarantee you've already seen his images. Uh, he's one of the most famous uh, international artists. And like a lot of international artists, um, he has taken to not just selling canvases and three-dimensional works, uh, but also selling to us regular folks. <clears throat> so prints and toys and all of that sort of thing. And I think when you see the history of Murakami's work, and what his content was, you'll find that somewhat interesting. Uh, of course, I'm not judging because artists should be able to make money however they can. Uh, but he may have judged himself uh, if he could go forward. And I think that's why this picture, um, he's kind of laughing a little bit. Um, and the exhibit in 2012, after he'd become internationally famous and started to produce uh, toys and work with big companies, um, he calls it ego. Uh, so he's he's taking a little bit of a pot shot at himself uh, and how he developed, um, but we'll see how he is as he develops through time. He does have a lot of content and critique going on. Uh, so the art style that um, became the name of an art movement uh, that he developed, uh, he named it Super Flat. <clears throat> and for Morikami, it wasn't just. Uh, the art style they were doing now. Super flat to him was how Japanese art had been for a very long time. And even extending that further, he said that in some ways, um, especially in the 80s with consumer culture, that um, Japanese culture had become super flat. It had left those connections with the past um, and what few connections they had with the past were shallow. He means that in a somewhat literal way. Uh, but he's also ta talking about the artwork as well. Um, so sorry about that. So he's influenced by a bunch of different things, and we'll look at some of them one at a time. So he's influenced by Yukio A, so the prints that we had seen. Uh, manga and anime, so picture here, I have a wrestling manga. Um, consumer culture, and he's critiquing it as well. Uh, Kawaii, which is cute culture. Um, and then hentai. So let's begin kind of like with Kawaii. Um, there's a surprising amount of scholarship in Kawaii, and there is a debate about the origins of Kawaii. Uh, so one idea is the origin is that um, it was marketing by Japanese toy companies um, and by Japanese entertainment companies uh, to find something that they could sell to people. Another um, idea about the origin is that it developed um, with young women, um, especially teenagers and girls in schools, as a response um, to the limits that were put on them. So in the um, late 60s and 1970s, uh, Japanese schools, um, which are quite regimented, uh, they had replaced the types of traditional tools that they'd used for calligraphy with mechanical pencils. And if you're aware of what mechanical pencils can do, it's very limited. They can only make one um, thickness of line. So what this left the students with is with an inability to express themselves as they had done with more traditional tools. So young people, especially young women, started to express themselves by adding little parts to their writing, uh, and you can see with the bunnies. This eventually developed into emojis, uh, especially in internet culture through the late 90s and early 2000s, and then eventually de developed to the emojis you know today. Uh, but also, you can't imagine uh, internet culture without cute. <clears throat> so I don't go on either side of the debate. I think it's a combination of both, uh, and um, they kind of fed back on each other. So one thing I like you to do, this is Hello Kitty, and uh, it's designed by Yuko Shimizu, not the one we're going to talk about a little bit later on, but a different one, um, and in 1974. And Hello Kitty is kind of an international icon nowadays, but look at Hello Kitty, and I want to ask you a question. Why is Hello Kitty cute? And that means, means see, I'm obvious, but um, try to pick out the various elements of Hello Kitty that make it cute. So um, do that in the extra credit board. I think it would be a good place to do it or in the comments of this video. And tell me what qualities this character has 
that make it cute. Um, so pause it and do that. Okay, now you're back. Uh, hopefully you made some comments. What people usually come up with is they determine first off, Hello Kitty's a kitty and kitties are cute. They're small and furry and we love them and we want to take care of them. Um, other things that people notice is they'll say, well, Hello Kitty has eyes that are really far apart, a really big head compared to their body. Um, all the lines are circular and there's no hard lines in it. Um, there's this bow at the top. Uh, the mouth is so small that it's basically disappeared. A little button nose. Um, all of these qualities make Hello Kitty look like a kitty, like a baby. And um, there's interesting psychological research uh, that's been going on for a long time on why people are attracted to cute. And it's not just young people. Uh, it's also grown-ups are attra attracted to cute things. Uh, and it used to be called um, these sets of qualities that make Hello Kitty cute. That used to be called uh, the baby schema in psycho psychological research. Uh, since then, um, usually the word neoteny is used. Um, and it was determined that these qualities cut across species. So if you see a little turtle, turtles are cute in the same way for the same reasons. Uh, if you see other animals, the same way. And the idea that developed out of this research is that um, things look cute and then you want to take care of them. So that's very useful for babies, especially for mammals uh, that need a lot of care when they're first born, um, for people to want to take care of them because they're so cute. But interestingly, also, uh, human beings as a species are particularly neotenous. Um, and you can see this very simply by looking up a picture of a baby chimpanzee uh, and then looking up a picture of a grown-up chimpanzee. So chimps are the, the species that is most closely related to human beings. And you'll probably notice that the babies more resemble um, not just baby humans, but also baby adults. Uh, so they have like a shorter snout uh, and more space in the forehead above their eyes. Um, but humans, because of our huge giant brains, we retain those proportions uh, and we lost some of our muscularity and, and some of our jaws. Uh, and as adults, we're basically still juveniles. And some researchers looked at um, people around the world and said, well, some people seem to be more neotenous than others. Uh, and some have determined that people on the island of Japan, um, for some reason, seem to be more neotenous than other populations. Um, so there may be a Japanese kind of culture thing um, that explains why so much of it's coming from here. But there's also been um, a kind of intersection with kawaii and attractiveness uh, that has... Um, that can be somewhat disturbing sometimes. So first off, the word kawaii is used as cute, like we're seeing with Hello Kitty, like a baby. Uh, but it's also sometimes used attractive as attractive, so especially when, when describing a young woman. Uh, and there has been an overlap between um, attractiveness and youthfulness, uh, both for um, men and women, um, but certainly um, women are getting more of this. And the idea of kind of looking like a baby or looking like a very young woman uh, is a way to stay attractive. Uh, and there's also been a somewhat disturbing overlap between pornography and kawaii. Uh, so some of the artists are going to look at those um, kind of deeper issues that are involved with kawaii um, when we see their work. So Hokusai, uh, this is his The Dream of Fisherman's Wife. Uh, so when people say the word hentai in the West, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as it does in Japan. So uh, traditionally in Japan, uh, when Hokusai created these pictures, uh, he called them hentai. Uh, it just meant bizarre. So it didn't necessarily mean <laughs> tentacle sex, which is probably what, what most West Westerners think of, but it just meant weird, strange, unusual uh, so that's this one, uh, The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife, but it could have been many other things. But in the West, it generally we're talking about, um, you know, this, this strange kind of like uh, particular type of Japanese porn that's, that's, you know, people having sex with tentacled animals. Uh, part of that developed out of um, the type of censorship that we see um, that had developed in Japan um, 
since the, the Meiji Restoration, but accelerated since 1950. So we talked about before about how Shunga pictures were not um, kept away from children. They weren't considered to be something that was to be kept under wraps in general. Uh, and, you know, explicit sexual imagery was accepted. Uh, but since then, um, there's been a lot of censorship. And a lot of that is because of um, the movement um, since the Measure Restoration, but again, accelerating since World War II, of kind of westernizing, Americanizing, or whatnot. Um, so that's why, that's part of the reason why you see a lot of these particular types of pornography because they don't have any other choice. It's the way that you can do it. Um, and again, uh, check out the example paper that one of the students uh, had written in previous classes that I have up for the A examples for the five page research paper and you see the whole story. It's a very interesting paper. So all of these elements come together into a movement that became super flat. So let's, let's check out the work first and then we'll look at Murakami's work, which is, is, is also interesting in, in a couple of other ways. Um, so the best way again to do this is on the internet. So these pieces are from a super flat show uh, in 2001, and it's Japanese artists, some Murakami's in here, but we also have a bunch of other artists. So let's check out some of these pictures. So all the elements they would seen this like kind of like overlap with youthfulness and attract attractiveness that we see in anime uh, and in hentai. Uh, we get that with Murakami and my lonesome cowboy kind of playing with the, um, Twinkie type of figures they would have with the amazing hair in anime, but you know, clearly kind of like sexualizing the figure, um, which are people have been doing. Then again, um, playing on the disturbing kind of overlap with um, Kawaii and sorry, my internet is being weird with Ka Kawaii and sexuality and with. Um, straight up pedophilia that you would see in Japanese pornography sometimes uh, with the teddy bear right here. And then another one uh, with the green caterpillars girl. Um, again, um, commenting on the overlap between kawaii and pornography, but also on the way that pornography tends to like chop body parts up and reassemble them. Um, so giving something like this worm and then, um, you know, it kind of meaningfully chops up uh, female genitals there. So remember since Hirohito had died, uh, they started to release this taboo against talking about, and remember it's kind of a symbolic ta taboo, uh, talking about World War II, so we see it in this one, in Zero, uh, Mitsubishi Zeros were a particular type of fighter plane uh, that were kind of a symbol of Japanese uh, military might. Um, and we see this one is made out of cellophane tape, cloth tape, uh, and there's an exhaust note electrically processed from the human voice. Uh, so it makes these sounds, but it's crushed and weak. And then other ones that are playing on anime. So we have the person on this ridiculous, with this mecha look uh, on, so, on top of the tiny motorcycle. Um, and then also talking about toys, um, Thomas the Tank Engine, uh, and even body horror. So the artists are looking at some of the cultural dynamics in Japan and saying, hmm, maybe we should take a closer look at this uh, and making their work in such a way so that you do so. Uh, so Murakami, he originally wanted to be an animator for Yoshinori Kanada. And uh, Galaxy Express 999 is one of the animations that his studio came up with. Um, and even in this picture, you can kind of see uh, what Murakami thought when he talks about flatness uh, when he's just talking about formal things. Uh, so this is a space adventure, as you might imagine. And in space, uh, that's the, I mean, we call it space, but it's a type of space that you create um, if you're creating it artistically where you can go in any direction. 
Um, it's the has the most depth that you could possibly have. Uh, but he noticed in these that despite that, we still have things kind of smacked up against the picture plane, uh, like we had seen in those Meiji period type of uh, Yukioa pictures. Uh, so he thought that flatness was inherent to Japanese visual culture, and this was a good example. But also culture in general, especially since um, the consumerism. Uh, and rampant capitalism uh, since uh, World War II. If you're interested in this anime, uh, you can usually get it um, on YouTube, but also I'm sure you have other ways to be able to see uh, these types of anime, but it's under copyright, but usually people don't care because it's kind of old. So he creates a lot of pictures where um, it's playing on marketing, like in this case, like Kawaii marketing and children's programs. Um, and we see lots of cute stuff here, cute little baby wearing a cute little ears outfit and, you know, expressing those neotenous baby schema type of things. And with these little creatures, the same way, you know, short little limbs and big heads. But what about this one with the extra eyes and the teeth? Yes? No? Probably not. Uh, but we have the smiling flowers in the background. Uh, so looking at the somewhat like disturbing side of what we would have in this. So when he's looking at Japanese culture, he says, <clears throat> Japanese people get fed TV and media for 24 hours a day. He says, now we have a chance to think, what is my life? Uh, consumer culture looks only in one direction, not evolved. In the 80s, Japanese people didn't think about the meaning of life because of the strong consumer culture. Now people are realizing there is an end. And the end he's talking about is the recession, uh, the lost decade. They have to think about it more than in the past. Young people are looking outside of consumer culture and asking, what is life? And since that time, there's certainly been like, um, by the end of the 90s, many Western societies had a little bit of a growth spurt from the internet um, and internet companies, uh, but that quickly collapsed again. Uh, and certainly the era that you're living in now in 2020 uh, especially with the pandemic, um, I, don't, I don't think there's many people your age that would not realize uh, the downsides to consumer cultures. So this one, uh, I'm sure you can identify it, super flat monogram. So identify it, you can do it, I won't even say it. You can do it in an extra credit board, uh, but easily kind of identified in this one. So the last artist we'll talk about is one of the artists we saw on the first day, and that's Yuko Shimizu, not the same one that designed Hello Kitty, a different one. Uh, and she's a Japanese graphic artist. Uh, she was at CCS a couple of years ago, um, and I didn't get to go to it, but I, but I was able to, to um, see the video and hear what she had to say. Uh, if you want to check out her website, it's fascinating, and you can buy some of her stuff, including this one. Uh, in card form, and she's got posters and all those types of things that you have to do. Um, she's a graphic artist, and a lot of her work, when you see it, uh, it's digitized, um, but she prefers to work with traditional mediums. So she likes to start with pen um, or pencil on paper, usually pen, um, and then she might digitize it later, uh, change the colors and such. But you can see it here, a lot of the hatching that she has. So drawing is something that she really likes, this thinness and thickness of line, that texture you get from as the ink kind of runs. <clears throat> and that's what she's really fascinated with. Uh, and I would say this one's kind of super flat as well. So we talked about the meaning of this one uh, before. We didn't really have to go over it. Um, but this particular one was used for the semi-permanent design conference catalog in 2004. So in the mid-2000s, um, Yuko Shimizu had been basically the uh, illustrator. Um, so she was using a lot of advertising. Um, so this was kind of like the height of her fame. But since then, she is still working. So on her website, you'll notice that she has works that are professional. Um, but also works that are for her, uh, what she wants to be her fine art series. Uh, so like many artists today, you know, you got to pay the bills, uh, but you also want to do something that's a little bit more interesting that people won't necessarily pay you for. Although now, again, you can buy these <laughs> products, postcards, anything you can imagine. So this one, the big wave, uh, like 
the um, first piece we were saying, Rio, uh, we see a lot of working with um, Japanese iconography. We have our great wave of Kanagawa again. Kanagawa again. Uh, but also working with other themes. She loves to um, kind of poke at you uh, like the early Dada artists would uh, and showing you an image that has maybe a unsettling combination of things. So we normally think of water as being flowing and we have that feeling, but in this one she has yarn and black and white. Um, so perhaps like an unsettling type of combination. And same thing where she kind of calls upon, um, in some ways, body horror, but in some ways not because of uh, the beauty of these particular ones. So this one's called, um, it's part of the Ultimate Unity series. Uh, you can see a woman broken up and reattached, uh, and then the same one on the bottom. Um, so she likes to work with um, what had been going in Japanese culture and commenting on it uh, and you know, often making things whimsical, with it, I mean, I think if you hear her talk, she's got a certain whimsy to her, uh, but she's also very down to earth at the same time. Um, and I think that's reflected in a lot of her works. The one in the top, uh, I think is a pretty obvious comment. You can, um, <laughs> if, if that's something you feel comfortable with, you can um, talk about that on the extra credit in the board, the snow machine. Uh, it's cute on one level, but also something else on the other level. And uh, like Murakami, she'll come out on Western art sometimes, um, but she is not an appropriation artist. So she's always like kind of mixing it and fitting into our series. Uh, so this one drowned in, a, in the sea of polka dots. Uh, she's working with Ophelia paintings from neo rathalite painters from the 19th century um, and then mixing it into her dot series uh, and using some anime type of um, conventions uh, in it as well. 